Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to answer them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Brayden Knudsen. I will be here with a paragraph grant will be entitled, When Your Family History is All Done, Temple Work Through Descendancy Research. After years on the sidelines, Catherine got started on her family's new passion. Her specialty is mentoring new family historians and helping them find success, and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she made. Catherine teaches family history classes at the BYU Family History Library and Riverton Family Search Library. She has also written a series for the Nauvoo Times on family history. When she reads, she enjoys reading music and fresh raspberries. Everybody, welcome to today's webinar. So glad to have you with us. And as Braden mentioned, our topic is when your family history is all done, temple work through descendancy research. So my guess is that most of you who are attending today have felt the truth of this beautiful promise in the Doctrine and Covenants that Elijah would plant in the hearts of the children, that's our hearts, the promises that we made to the fathers. And I like to think of fathers as any of our loved ones on the other side. And then these beautiful words that the hearts of the children, again our hearts, would turn to our fathers. So I think we're seeing that so much in the church and probably each of you have felt those tuggings on your heart to reach out to your family on the other side. But what if you get in family tree and you're greeted with a sight like this? Your tree is completely full. Maybe Aunt Martha has done just everything there is to do. And I've talked to people that just feel discouraged when they look in family tree and see that there doesn't look like there's a lot of opportunity for doing temple work here. Well, if that's what you're faced with, the solution may be in descendancy research, the topic of our webinar today. So let's take a quick look at what we're going to be talking about today. First of all, very briefly, we'll talk about three keys to success in family history, and they're especially important when doing descendancy research. Next, we will talk about exactly what descendancy research is. Sometimes we may think we know, and then um, we run into trouble because we have some assumptions that maybe weren't quite right. And then finally, we'll give you some very practical tips for how to do descendancy research. So let's go ahead and dive in. What are those three keys to success in family history? The first and most important one I'm sure will not be surprising to anybody, and that is to follow the Spirit. In fact, what I've discovered is that doing family history is one of the best tutorials in learning to recognize the Spirit. Sometimes if we rely too much on technology, we tend to block out the Spirit, or I've even talked to people who uh, they trust the technology so much that even when they feel promptings of the Spirit, they dismiss them, not because they don't have faith in the Spirit, because, but because they don't trust themselves and they maybe put a little too much trust in the technology. So I just want to emphasize that so much. It's important in every aspect of family history to follow the Spirit. And then, as I mentioned, the added advantage of doing that is that we grow in our ability to discern and to follow the promptings of the Spirit. So the next key is to be consistent and diligent. Why do I mention that in connection with descendancy research? Well, it's because there's a very good chance on descendancy that you will soon be finding a lot of names. And sometimes when we find many, many names all at once, it's a temptation to cut corners. And I don't think that's what the Lord wants us to do. I don't think that's what he's expecting. It's, in my mind, more important to make a consistent and diligent effort than to feel like you, for instance, have to get all your family history done this weekend or something like that. It's kind of like home and visiting teaching, really. You're never done with home and visiting teaching, right? And the, the key to success there is to be consistent and diligent, and it's the same with family history. Finally, Use what you know to discover what you don't know. And I have found that whenever I feel like I'm looking into a black tunnel as far as my family history, when I just don't know what to do next, it's because I've forgotten this key principle. 
If you use what you already know, you'll have the best possible chance of linking to things that you don't know. So you always want to start with that solid foundation. So those are three keys to keep in mind while doing descendancy research that will help you find success. So let's be clear then about what exactly we're talking about when we say descendancy research. We all know what descendants are, right? But what does it mean to do descendancy research and find temple work that way? Well, it's probably a, a good way to explain. A good way to explain that would be to contrast descendancy with what we might call traditional or ancestral research. So you remember probably maybe this was the way you were first taught to do family history or your parents did it this way. In the early, especially earlier in the church, in church history, we were asked to trace our lines back in time from parent to parent to parent. So to illustrate, I'd start with myself, and then I'd move to my parents, and then I'd move to my grandparents, my great grandparents, and so forth, until I, till there were no more records. And I would do the same thing on my mother's side. So you'd start basically at the bottom of the pyramid and work your way backwards in time until you ran out of records and couldn't go any further. Well, descendancy research, let's define that. It means you started out the same way, so you trace a line back to an ancestral couple, but then you do a U-turn, and you trace their descendants forward until the privacy period. So let's look at what that looks like. So you start with yourself again, but this time, and again, I'm assuming most people who want to do descendancy are doing it because they've got full trees. So you look at your full tree, and the ones that are outlined in red illustrate the line that I've chosen to follow in this example. So I go from myself to my father to his mother and then to her mother, and I keep going back until I arrive at a direct line couple. And what you want to do in, that, in choosing that couple is to go back, depending on your age, about six to nine generations. You want to end up in the early 1800s or the late 1700s. Why would that be? Well, it's because in most countries, the records start to get difficult to use prior to that time. And so if you want to have the best experience of success right now, especially, you know, most of us don't consider ourselves professionals, right? If you're a professional, then yes, by all means, if you've got experience in that early research, go back farther. But for most of us, if we don't have that experience in early records, we're going to have the best success sticking to the early 1800s or the late 1700s as a starting point for our descendancy research. So then, once, the, once we've selected that ancestral couple, we find all their children and their spouses. And then we find the children of the first couple, and then keep going down, finding the children of the children of the children, until you run into the privacy period, which, as you may know, is 110 years from today. So we're not supposed to do temple work for anybody born less than 110 years from today, unless we have permission of the closest living relative. So you would find all those descendants from that couple there, and then all the descendants of the next child couple, all the next ones, next ones. So you can see that descendancy has a great potential for finding a lot of temple names. Now, of course, as you go in family tree, you may find that um, some of these names have already been done, and that's great. But in my experience, I've actually never found anybody who couldn't find names through descendancy research, even on a full tree. So what I'm trying to say is that your success, your chances of success are very good with descendancy research, even on a full tree. So how do I do descendancy research? What are the tips and tricks, the nuts and bolts, for actually doing the work? So there's four basic steps, and we've kind of already gone over most of them, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper. So let's look at those four basic steps. So first of all, on your family tree, you choose a couple about six to nine generations back as your starting point. And then here's a very important part that sometimes is forgotten, and that is to verify that line back to the chosen couple. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. 
Then, as we illustrated in the last graphic, you uh, trace, trace those descending lines forward. Sometimes it feels like chasing, right? You trace those descending lines forward systematically. And then finally, you enter whatever names are missing from family tree into family tree, and you clear them for temple work. So let's go through step by step and talk about some of the tips to help you be successful in that effort. So first of all, picking that ancestral couple. Here are the tips. The best one that I could give you is to pray for guidance and be open to inspiration. You know, you would think I learned this lesson, but whenever I try to do it myself without the help of the Spirit, I just spin my wheels. And whenever I pray and I have a humble and open heart and really listen to that guidance, I find that I'm guided to fertile areas of work. So pray sincerely for guidance and then be open to that inspiration that comes. And again, just to reiterate, choose a time frame, frame when the best records are available in the country in which you're working, and normally that's going to be about 1800 and forward. And the last tip is to ignore green temple icons, icons for now. Sometimes people will start descendancy research, they'll get in family tree and say, oh my goodness, a green temple icon. And it's just so exciting to find somebody who looks like they need temple work. But as we'll be talking about later, those names need to be pretty carefully verified before we assume that they need temple work right away. So those are the tips for choosing your starting couple. And then I thought it might be helpful to just kind of show you in practice what I do. And this is not right or wrong. This is, uh, I've talked to other people who do it differently. And so this is just one way to do it and you may find a way that works better for you. But for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why, the fan chart seems to be the best way for me to look over the family and try to find a, a starting place. So what you're seeing on the screen here is actually an example that I, I worked on for a friend of mine who had a full tree and was feeling, it seemed when I talked with her, she seemed to be feeling a little discouraged that she couldn't find names on her tree. So I offered to help her and she was glad for that and we looked over the tree and as I was just again tried to be prayerful and humble and really listen to those promptings, I found myself drawn towards a certain name. It's the one that's circled here. Abraham Chadwick. And just to be clear on that, I'm sure with your own experiences in listening to the Spirit, there's times when you get answers immediately and there's times when it takes a little bit longer. This happened to be a time when the answer came pretty quick, but if it doesn't, then you just keep trying and keep praying and just stick with it knowing that the Lord is going to answer your prayers. So in this case, I chose Abraham Chadwick and I thought, okay, I'm just going to do a sanity check here and see if this looks like it's got some good potential. It, it fit the parameters of what I was looking for, kind of the early 1800s. And the name was, a, one thing I like to do is choose names that are a little bit unusual. And this is a, a good key if you're starting out, because if we choose, especially when you're starting, if you choose a name like, um, you know, John Smith, it just is a lot harder because there's so many of them. So if you choose a more unique name, it does make it a little easier. So I looked at this Abraham Chadwick. Come to find out that he was actually one of the earliest people in my friend's family to join the church. And so that was exciting. Uh, I could just imagine everything he went through and his great faithfulness in accepting the gospel as one of the earliest members of his family. And as I looked through, you know, knowing that about him, I wasn't surprised to see that his descendants were basically all done. I'm sure that when he accepted the restored gospel, he got busy on that right away. So it didn't look like I was going to find a lot of names tracing his descendants down. But I decided to go back a generation wondering if any of his siblings had come over to the States, if any of them had accepted the gospel. So I started looking at that. You see over there on the right hand side, we've got Samuel, Chadwick, and Esther, who are Abraham's parents, and then all Abraham's siblings are showing below. And again, as I just tried to be prayerful about this and, and wanting so much to help my friend, I found that I was drawn towards the last name on the list, interestingly enough, to Sarah Ann Chadwick. So I thought, okay, I'll check her out and see if it looks like there's some good potential here. So 
I brought up her screen and saw that she was married to George Bradbury and saw that she had some kids and I thought okay well I better start checking those kids to see what the possibilities are and lo and behold the spirit had led me to a good place I found that all of her kids except one did not have spouses yet in family tree and the one that did have a spouse only had a couple of children well back then of course most families were large if both parents lived a, 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 a normal life and so I thought there's some good opportunity there and so that was my initial check to see if this was a line that was worth pursuing. Um, and as I found out later, it was. I was able to find the missing spouses and the missing children. So then, after I had selected a line, and again, I just kind of did that sanity check right at the beginning, but then I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to be wasting my time it, just in case it turned out that the, there was a mistake in this line someplace and Abraham really wasn't my friend's progenitor. So whenever you choose an ancestral couple, here are some tips for verifying. One is just to simply check the sources that are in Family Tree already. And if there aren't sources, then look for some and add them. And we're not talking about doing you know, weeks of research or even really a day of research, but just kind of sanity checking, going, OK, uh, do the do the lines all line up? Do the parents are the ages reasonable? Are there any kids that were born you know before their mother or something? Any obvious mistakes? Which is actually the next point, because and I, this just happened to me the other day. I was choosing a line for descendancy, got in there, and the dad was born in 1844. Then I looked at one of the sons that I was considering doing the descendancy research on. Well, guess what? He was born in, did I say 49? So the dad's born in 49. The son was born in 44. So we had an instance of a son who obviously did not belong in that family. He, and it turned out that he was in a completely different family. But that age difference was a clue for checking that out and saying, OK, we got to resolve some of these mistakes before we start doing descendancy on this. Because because otherwise, this is what could happen. Suppose that I'd started with me and gone up through that line, and you see those kind of dark brown, uh, that dark brown ancestral couple. And if I hadn't checked them, and I just started doing ancestral research, or excuse me, descendancy research, and then something sh showed up in my research to prove that they weren't the right couple. Well then, I've all done. I've done a lot of research that actually wasn't my research, and I wasn't able to do work on my own family. So that's a reason that it's so important to verify that line back to your starting couple. So after you've done that, then the next point is to trace your descending lines forward systematically. So let's take a look at some tips for that. The first one is it's a good idea to choose a strategy so that you don't get uh, kind of lost in a bowl of spaghetti. So uh, you may just decide to do, for instance, all the firstborn descendants and then all the second, as we can see in this illustration. So suppose that yellow couple is my ancestral couple, then I found all their kids and spouses, and then I might do the, all the children of the first kid and spouse, and then the next one, and next one, and so forth. And that way, if I'm going through systematically, I'm less likely to leave somebody out, and I'm more likely not to get lost. It's going to be just a lot easier to keep track of where I am and to make sure that I'm just going through all the possible lines. Another important thing when you're doing descendancy research, or actually any research, but it's especially important in descendancy, is to use some kind of research log. My personal favorite is a log called a timeline grid. And we'll probably have classes on that later on, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today. But just to give you the idea of how to use this type of research log, it's my favorite because it fits pretty much all on one page, and it gives you a bird's eye view of the family. So for instance, uh, uh, here's just a, a look at the timeline grid without anybody in it. You notice there's a column for every census. And so this, this type of research tool is best used in countries and time periods that have regular censuses. And then you do one row per person. So here's an example of a completed timeline grid. I put the name of the couple up at the top. So this is the timeline grid for Alice Augusta Bescovy, Richard Middleton, and their children. And then I put that Alice is the daughter of Henry Bescovy and Sarah Nuttery. Just 
to give it some context. And then I just trace Alice through the census. So you see in the first column in 1851, she's there as a two-year-old. 61, she's there as a 13-year-old. So the age is approximately right. We'd expect her to age 10 years. And then by the next census, she's married. And so then I trace her through. And she actually did have more kids than Louisa, but we didn't have enough room on the slide. But you get the idea from this. You just trace the person through, and you find just the key information that you need for temple work, which is typically their name, their age, or their birth date approximately, which you can determine from their age, their birthplace, and their family relationships. So that is just a very quick overview of this type of research log. And you notice down there at the bottom of the slide, there's a link. And you can go to that link to get more information. OK, and so then the last step is to enter the missing names in family tree and clear them for temple work. What are the tips to do that? I found it helpful to focus on one family, parents and children at a time. I find that if I focus on one person, I sometimes don't have the context I need. And if I focus on multiple generations, that's too much. I can't keep it straight in my head. But I find that if I focus on one set of parents and their children and enter them as a family in family tree, then I'm able to work at a good pace and I feel like I'm being accurate when I'm doing the work. The next thing that I like to do is I will, for those of you who like to use two monitors, I will put my timeline grid up on one monitor and then I'll put family tree on the other, as you can see in this illustration. And even if you don't have two monitors or you don't like working with two monitors, you can just split your screen and put the timeline grid on one half of the screen and put family tree on the other. And so as you see, when I went in, I had my timeline grid completed. So I knew um, Alice's life, basically. I knew her parents, I knew who she married, and I knew her children. So then I went into Family Tree and saw, OK, she doesn't have a spouse, and she doesn't have any kids, although her parents were in place, and they were who I expected. So that was a confirmation to me that I was working in the right place. And then I just went through, and one by one, I added those names into Family Tree that were on the timeline grid. As I added those names, I checked each one for the following things. One is that, an important one, is I checked for duplicates. And we'll talk in a few minutes about why that's so important. And then also, as I go through, I like to add the sources for any person that I add. There's a couple of reasons to do that. One is that as you add sources, you may learn something about the family that will help you find further temple work. For instance, you might discover that in one census, a nephew or an aunt or a um, grandchild was living with the family that you hadn't known about before. And then the other reason to add the sources is that research has shown that when the more sources you have on your person in family tree, the less likely they are to be changed incorrectly. Because, and I feel that way, when I go and look at a, a person in family tree, if I start to wonder if they're right, and then I look at the sources, and I see that that person has been very carefully documented, and that the sources appear accurate, then that gives me reassurance that that person really has been entered correctly. So it's a good idea to add the sources as you go along. And if you've added sources in Family Tree, you know, for instance, on census records, if you add them for one person, it gives you the opportunity to add them for the rest of the family. So you can actually save some time there by adding the sources as you enter the, pre the people in Family Tree. Another one that we sometimes forget about is that it's important to verify whether each child lived past eight. And I wish we were in a real classroom. I'd ask if, uh, why, why that would be. But I'm guessing that many of you would have answered, because if they don't live past date, they only need sealing to parents. So you want to prove at least, you don't necessarily have to have a death date for the child, but you do want to prove that they lived past eight to determine whether they need all the ordinances or just sealing to parents. And then finally, as we talked about with the um, privacy period that the church has implemented, if a person was born less than 110 years ago, we're supposed to get permission from the closest living relative. Or if you have just no way to find that closest living relative, for instance, some of my descendancy research in England, I would it would probably take me months, seriously, to find the closest living relative. 
But if they're only maybe, you know, a few months or a year or two away from that 110 year deadline, then I'll put them on a calendar. Like you can use Google Calendar for that or set a, an alarm in your smartphone, something that will alert you when that person passes the 110 year deadline and then you're able to do their temple work. And then the last thing, in line with the counsel of the brethren to us, we want to reserve only those names that we can do within a reasonable period of time. You might be familiar, if you've been doing uh, research lately, it, I think it's what been maybe, oh, I want to say maybe a year or maybe a bit less than that, that that blue banner has started showing on the temple list. And it says that if a name has been reserved for more than two years, then the church is... Um, they're authorized to unreserve the name. What the, the latest statistic that I heard of the names that were reserved and weren't being done in uh, North America and Canada, 12 million. So we had 12 million names sitting in people's temple queue that had just been sitting and sitting and sitting forever. And so the brethren want to avoid that for obvious reasons. Could you imagine being one of those people on the other side just waiting and waiting for your work to be done and you're sitting in someone's temple queue and it just never gets done? So that we're counseled to just reserve the names that we can do within a reasonable period of time. And so even if you go to the temple once a week, that's 52 endowments a year. So the reason I wanted to mention that is sometimes, unfortunately, we get into a mindset in the church where there's maybe even a little of competition and it becomes maybe a matter of pride that, well, I found 4,000 names or I found this many names. And that's honestly not what temple work is about. The, the important thing is that we're serving our loved ones and it's not a contest to see who can find the most names. So reserve the names that you can reasonably do, share them with family and ward members if they're able to help, or otherwise share them with the temple. But don't let them just sit in your temple queue for years and years. So we talked at the beginning, I said, don't pay attention to green arrows for now. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about why it's important to verify any of those, or actually they're green temples now, why it's important to verify any of those green temples that you find. So is this a fact or a myth? I'll let you read that statement while I take a drink of water. So if you voted myth, you are absolutely right. But the thing is, this actually surprises a lot of people because it's a church website. And when we go to our ward directory, we expect the ward directory to be reasonably correct, right? We expect our lesson manuals to be correct. So I've talked to a number of people who were under the understanding that FamilySearch had just populated all this information into Family Tree and verified it all so that we could find temple names. But that actually is not what happened. Let's look at how the data got into Family Tree. The first source of data for Family Tree in the very early days before it was even called Family Tree, back in the days of the IGI, if you remember that, and New Family Search, the data was actually first taken from completed temple ordinances. Why would they put completed temple ordinances in what became Family Tree? Well, because we wanted to be able to check and see if work was done so that we didn't duplicate it. Then also extracted records were added. For those of you who may not be familiar with extraction, it's kind of the old version of the indexing program. So what happened in about the 1960s was that the temples were in danger of having to shut down or strongly curtail their sessions. And by the way, this is all documented in a book called Hearts Turn to the Fathers. And that book is available to, at Deseret Book. It's the history of family history in the church. So because the temples were not having enough names, it was very, as you can imagine, without the internet, 
it was a lot harder to get family names back then. And so patrons, if they couldn't get their own family names, then they couldn't come to the temple. And so they had very few people coming on a lot of the sessions. So a proposal was made, according to this book, Hearts Turned to the Fathers, a proposal was made to the First Presidency to have volunteers go in and write down the names from birth, marriage, and burial records. Does that sound familiar? So that's what we do with indexing, right? So in the early days of extraction, the volunteers would write down these names and then they would be given to the temple. And if when you went to the temple and didn't have a family name, you would be given one of those extracted names. And then, of course, all those extracted names for whom temple work had been done were also put in family tree. LDS church membership records feed data into family tree. I saw an example of this when my uncle passed away. Uh, as soon as his ward clerk marked his record deceased, he showed up in family tree and his temple work was attached to him. And then, whoops, hit the wrong button there, sorry. So LDS church membership records. And then finally, the other major source of data is user submissions. So in the old days, those would have been the four generation programs, if any of you are familiar with that, where the prophet asked all the members of the church to send in four generations of their family. And those were put, many of those were put into family tree. And then today, of course, people can add names either manually or by um, uploading a JEDCOM or syncing with an Ancestry account, that type of thing. So as you can see, there's a lot of potential for duplication here where someone might make a user submission and not realize that the name was already in family tree or just twice recently I've actually talked with or become aware of actually through a family member and a close friend of people on their trees who intentionally added duplicates when they asked the person why they had intentionally added duplicates, it was because they wanted to work on what they thought was their own tree. And they didn't realize that family tree is not like ancestry, where users can just have their own separate trees, but family tree is meant to be one master tree of the world's people. So there aren't supposed to be any duplicates in it. There's just supposed to be one record for every person who has lived on the earth. So that's why when you find a green temple icon, it may not, that, that person may not really need temple work. They may, but they may be a duplicate. And so it's important to search for those duplicates first before you just assume that that person needs temple work. A friend of mine who's a retired physician actually did a, a statistical study on the names in, in his own tree and found that for names before 1800, of those that looked like they need temple work, only about 5% of them actually did. The rest were duplicates. The stats were better for names after 1800. Those were at about 50%. So if you're before 1800, you have a very strong chance of duplication on a green temple. After 1800, uh, about average is 50%. So you can see that it's it's worth doing that checking because every time we go to the temple for someone who already has their work done and we do it again, we're not able to do the work for someone who really needs it. Now, we're all going to make mistakes, right? This isn't meant to instill fear in anybody and say, don't you ever do a duplicate. We're, I, I've done a duplicate. We all make mistakes. But there's a difference between um, being careful and unintentionally making a mistake and just not even taking the care to see if there's duplicates. The second one is what I'm talking about, is that we should just at least take the care and make reasonable efforts to make sure we're not doing duplicate work. President Hinckley underscored this when he called duplication one of the most troublesome aspects of our temple activity. So we'll just take that extra time and make sure that we're doing work for people who really need it. So let's review what we've talked about today. The steps for descendancy research are to choose that ancestral couple about six to nine generations back, verify your line back to the couple, then trace the descendants forward systematically, and then finally enter those missing names in family tree and clear them for temple work. And let's just run over those three keys to success again. Follow the spirit. Be consistent and diligent. Don't feel like you got to do everything in one weekend or get clear back to Noah or whatever. Just make that consistent effort as led by the Spirit. And then finally, remember to use what you know to discover what you don't know. 
Um, more on the timeline grids is available. I just included this slide here so that you can get more information if you're interested in that. And that concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. Are there any questions that I need to address? So we did have one question um, from Colleen Lyman. She asked, how do you feel about Hope Chest Descendancy Research? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I consider Hope Chest to be an advanced tool. And the reason I say that is that it finds it just gives you a list of people who appear to need ordinances, but it doesn't set them. It's not immediate. The context of that person is not immediately obvious. So it, especially if those people are before 1800, many of those people, as we discussed, will actually not need temple work. And many of the ones, about half of the ones afterwards, will not need temple work. The concern I have with Hope Chest and similar programs, Hope Chest is not the only one, but the concern I have with that is that what it's not with the program itself, it's with the way it's used. And what I found is that especially youth are being taught to just go in and click all the green temples without even checking to see if there's duplicates or without even knowing the family. And that's another concern I have about programs that just randomly find people on your tree is that Okay, you saw that when I did that timeline grid, I got to know that family. And by going through that brief exercise, and honestly, that you can do that in maybe an hour or two if you just get on Ancestry and find all those census records. So when I did that, I got to know that family. I got to know their relationships. I knew when they lived, knew when they died. So it was actually a lot easier for me to find duplicates. And my heart was turned to them in love. I found that when people go through and use a tool, whatever the green temple hunting tool is, I don't want to be bad mouthing any certain tool, but when they use that type of tool and the family, the names are out of context and the the temple names look like they need work but they may not, then I, I, I don't know. For me, I just find it a lot easier to do my quick research on the timeline grid first and enter the names that way. And also, the other concern, Colleen, that I would have about using a program like that is that we tend to maybe rely a little bit too much on the technology and not enough on the spirit. Let me share. How are we for time, Braden? We have a little, let me share with you a quick experience that I had that may relate to your question, Colleen. And that is that one of my friends had a son who went to young, young men and his leaders with the best of intentions showed them how to use a program to find green temples and just click the names without any verification and um, just do the work. So her son brought this uh, ordinance request home and it had about six names on it. Fortunately, my friend was um, one of the most faithful people I know and she got the prompting that something was wrong and frankly she was very puzzled by that because when you're doing family history and your son is being obedient and he's learned to do this at young men you don't expect the spirit to tell you something's wrong right and so she was very puzzled and so she and she had not done her own family history at that point it, it was new to her so she called me up and said okay something weird is going on and she told me what I had just related to you and so I came over to her house we sat down at the computer and looked at the names and lo and behold all of them were questionable we could not prove any of them and so she then she started to understand why the spirit had warned her that those names found out that, that way were that her son should not go ahead and do those and another good thing that happened out of that is we actually started working together doing the process that I've illustrated to you today and she's found I would say hundreds of names in the last couple of years and again it's not a numbers game but I mentioned that just to say over the last couple of years she's been able to find valid names for temple work by using the process that we talked about today so Colleen I hope that answers your question do we have any other questions that we need to address Nope. Okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much. It was a privilege to be with you today, and I do wish you the very best with your descendancy research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for the wonderful presentation. Um, 
This presentation and others can be found on our BYU Family History Library website um, and also on our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. Um, feel free to check our schedule for more webinars coming up this week and later this month. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.